Welcome everybody to Wednesday, August 17th, 6 p.m. Pacific time, 7 p.m. Mountain, 8 p.m. Central, and 9 p.m. Eastern. And if you're somewhere else in the world, you figure out the time. So mm -hmm. glad to have you here for Scrum and Wine. Uh, we have a great special guest tonight. Uh, Tim Meyer is going to speak with us about culture. Uh, so we'll have that going. And uh, just want to, you know, happy to see everybody again, as always. Uh, we're going to, as we go forward, we're going to mix a little bit. We did an in-person one last month. We might mix that in just a little bit, but we definitely want to keep the power of our virtual Scrum and Wine going because we built so many relationships from around the globe, which is pretty cool. So we will we'll keep that going regardless of how the mix changes over time. And, uh, and there's a lot of fun in that. All right, I'm going to start us off with what is called Small Bites. Uh, small Bites is a little bit about what's happening in the Agile and Scrum world and a couple of uh, couple of uh, tools and transformation things that uh, my team has built that I wanna talk to you guys about too. And then we'll introduce Tim. So let me go ahead and get that going. <clears throat> okay, Scrum and Wine, welcome. So we do it monthly, as I said, virtual, uh, Long Beach. Um, we haven't done Sacramento or Santa Monica in a few years, but we did do Long Beach last month. All right, first of all, let's start off with a kind of our unique award-winning certified Scrum developer course. I say award-winning because I can, who knows what that really means. But certified Scrum developer course, we teach the entire track. Um, we are the only ones who actually teaches the entire track, the certified Scrum developer, the advanced <laughs> certified Scrum developer, and the certified Scrum professional developer. Um, I teach that, I co-train that with Ivan Biddles. We taught the certified Scrum professional developer a few months ago and uh, had a great class in there, the first and inaugural one, and it's the only one, and we're teaching that one again in November, but nobody else in the world teaches that particular class. Uh, but it creates you at that certif certified Scrum professional level with the developer stance. The Scrum developer course is meant for everybody. We teach that pretty often. Uh, there's the upcoming times that we have for this course, which is in September, one an advanced one in October, and then CSPD in November. So you can see those upcoming. So join us for one of those. I believe every single Agile coach should go to the Scrum developer course. You don't need to go to the advanced ones unless you're a programmer or you're in that type of space. But if you're coaching anybody, you really need to understand the whole team. So that's what I got to say about that. All right, what's going on in the world? Uh, Kanban week, start with that. That's coming up in August, uh, just next week. Uh, Kanban Global Summit features world leaders sharing their experience with the Kanban method and offering proven techniques. Kanban 2022 will be held in beautiful San Diego, California. Features keynotes, workshops, coaching clinics, social receptions, and learning labs. Deep dive on topics like how to talk about Kanban in your organization, enterprise scaling, enterprise agility, coaching with the Kanban maturity model, upstream Kanban, improving predictability, and much more. Who should attend? Program presentations and interactive workshops is appropriate for executives, operations, directors, department managers, program managers, project managers, PMO heads, process improvement leaders, team leaders, and team members, human resource managers involved in corporate development and everyone interested in Kanban. Now, if that doesn't include you, I don't know who else would have been missed. Um, so register at kanbanevents.com, register.kanbanevents.com. All right, what we were just chatting about a little bit ago, one of my favorite, uh, absolute favorite things to do is I love going to coaching retreats. Um, and I'm super excited that we were able to put it back on the calendar. Uh, I haven't been to one since 2019. This Agile Coaching Retreat coming up is going to be in beautiful Banff, Canada. If anybody's ever been there, it is an amazing spot, Coaching Retreat or not. It was a beautiful place. I've been there once before. It's coming up in September 11th through 13th. And regardless of where you are in your coaching journey, there is room to grow, room to gain more. We partner with Scrum Alliance, Certified Agile Coaches, International Coaching Federation Coaches, Certified Scrum Professionals, and others to learn new ways of working and take your coaching to the next level. This Agile Coach Retreat is a fantastic opportunity to grow your network, 
gain new perspectives, and integrate coaching tools and approaches all while enjoying the majesty, majesty, majesty number two, majesty, majesty of the Canadian Rockies near Banff, Alberta. Scrum Alliance Agile Coaching Retreat is, is for anyone interested in Agile coaching or who want to grow their coaching skills. You connect with other Agilists from around the world, build something useful for the Agile community, which is what's really powerful. You actually will build and create something, not just learn. It's a giving back opportunity. We invite all coaches of all experience levels and aspiring coaches to join this. It's a pretty awesome event. You can find this on the Scrum Alliance website or go to eventbrite.com and look for Agile Coach Retreat BAMP 2022. All right, next up, DevOpsCon Hybrid Edition. Uh, hybrid events are pretty cool. Uh, we did our last Global Scrum Gathering as a hybrid event and, uh, and it worked pretty well. So, so pretty cool if you have that opportunity. Uh, so every September, DevOps Conference New York is in the meeting place for DevOps enthusiasts and the most important players in the software industry. The upcoming DevOps Con New York provides the ideal framework for extensive networking, exchanging experiences, and your future successful projects. The goal of DevOps and continuous delivery is to improve code quality while shortening release cycles. The less unplanned code network is required, the more successful the project will be. It's by Aero Matia from Quest. September 26th through 29th, um, there's an expo. And like I said, it's online also. So hybrid integrates both, you know, online activities and events and still being able to participate with what happens in the actual rooms. So pretty cool for those. All right, next up, International Conference on Agile Software Development and Application Lifecycle Management, also coming up here in September about the same time. This is in San Francisco. This aims to bring together leading academic scientists, researchers, and research scholars to exchange and share their experiences and research results on aspects of agile software development and application lifecycle management. It also provides a premier interdisciplinary platform for researchers, practitioners, and educators to present and discuss the most recent innovations, trends, and concerns, as well as practical challenges encountered and solutions adopted in the field of agile software development. So check that out if you're in the San Francisco area in late September. Star West. Star West is one of the longest running and most respected conferences on software testing and quality assurance. This one is in Anaheim and online coming up in early October. This event features over 100 learning and networking opportunities, covers a wide variety of some of the most in-demand topics and in innovation, testing for DevOps, test and release automation, testing for developers, test strategy, planning and monitoring, test transformation, agile testing, security testing, and test leadership. So if you have any interest in testing and improving the quality for your teams, or your projects, this is the way to go. Okay, coming up, uh, Agile Vienna. So this is our global Scrum gathering from Scrum Alliance. Um, no, this one's different. This is not the global Scrum gathering. Different conference, different conference. All right, Agile Vienna, because this is Agile, not Scrum Alliance, sorry. Agile Vienna, October 6, 2022. Agile Vienna will nourish and cultivate the Agile mindset. The theme is Agile transformation, how to spark, drive, and communicate change. In this conference, you'll be challenged on how to spark, drive, and communicate the change. Which approach do you take? Is it measurable? Visionaries and companies will share stories. There's high quality workshops and an open space complements the learning. Uh, I was thinking about Vienna because Vienna was the last global scrum gathering in 2019. Beautiful city, by the way, really enjoyed it. So that's what's going on there. So Agile Vienna. And here's what I was thinking about. The global scrum gathering for Europe is coming up in Lisbon, also in October. Uh, this will be a hybrid event also. We're excited to bring this to you. It's finally happening in Europe after the two year hiatus. You can look forward to valuable learning curated by you, our community. We aim to amplify voices, mastery of emerging leaders and skilled professionals and be together again to celebrate. Uh, it is a hybrid, so we kind of call it uh, Lisbon and beyond. So the hybrid is a lot of fun. We did the hybrid for the Denver one in the US back in June also.
Okay, another one here. This one is in Los Angeles. So this one here is local in my backyard. International Conference on Agile Software Development Methods and Patterns aims to bring together leading academic scientists, researchers, and research scholars to share experience on all aspects of agile software development methods and patterns. It also provides a premier interdisciplinary platform for researchers, practitioners, and educators to present and discuss the most recent innovation trends and concerns. So check this out for Los Angeles coming up in late October. Agile and DevOps East, finally for you East Coasters. This one is going on in Orlando, Florida and online early November. Discover the latest in Agile and DevOps methods, tools, and leadership practices. Get ideas and inspiration from experts and peers. This Agile DevOps East brings the practitioner seeking to accelerate and the delivery of reliable, secure software applications. Check it out at agiledevopseast.techwell.com. All right, if you haven't downloaded this, download it, do it today, do it after our, our session. State of Agile Coaching Report. This is the second annual State of Agile Coaching Report that's finally been published. It's available on Scrum Alliance website. This focuses on one question, how do Agile coaches and the organizations they serve measure impact? This is gathered uh, from data from over 2,000 professional Agile coaches who share their input on the impact of Agile coaching, such as return on investment, value, and the measurements to define success. It was first published by Scrum Alliance, the Business Agility Institute, and IC Agile to capture and share a point-in-time synopsis synopsis of the coaching industry. So definitely download this, some really good insights. So follow this along and you'll probably see this coming out uh, annually as we go forward. Okay, if you haven't heard about our solution, uh, I find it is unique, it is different because we guide organizations on their transformation journey with our Kadomi Agile Transformation Ecosystem. It works with any type of framework or no framework at all. Just use Scrum. Scrum itself scales, and Kadomi can help guide you on your journey. Helps you go from your current state towards agility. It's done by establishing enterprise-wide agile teams, forming agile leaders, and measuring your progress along the journey. We understand that each organization's transformation journey is unique. So we created Kadomi ecosystem as an adaptable and customizable framework consisting of teams, programs, products, accelerators, tools to guide you on your agile journey. Check that out at kadomi.co to learn more about it or reach out to myself, Hutch or Griffin. All right, I'm really excited to announce our enterprise level for Kadomi, <laughs> our Kadomi tools platform. We have a premium, which looks like we've added an extra I in premium. Uh, we have premium and enterprise here. So <laughs> it's really premium. It's got one extra I in it. Premium <laughs> and enterprise. So premium and enterprise <laughs> level. So Griffin's probably going into the PowerPoint <laughs> one. In the right yeah, that was, that was, <laughs> you got a little carried away there. So we have Whoa. built the enterprise version of this, which allows you as a coach, as a leader, as a scrum master, whatever you are, to look at your team's performance across all the teams in your enterprise and see how are they doing on their agile journey and to guide you towards more. So what that looks like, there are two main tools in here, a sprint capacity planner to help you with a little more prediction based on velocity and capacity combined, introducing Kaizen and interrupts also. The other tool, this agility metrics engine, which is where the real power comes in because this brings in a rubric concept to give you a visualization experience where you can not just see where you are at today, but you can look in and say, where do I need to go and which one is most interesting for me, for myself, for my team, for multiple teams, for the entire enterprise. There's a free version, a premium version for just $5 a month, sign up, check it out. You get access to a lot of bonus features. And then the enterprise level where you can guide as many teams as you want 
contact us. We've set it up for your organization and your size. So we'll customize, uh, customize the enterprise agreement for you. That is available at kadomitools.com. So if you haven't registered, definitely register and check it out. Okay, let me welcome Tim Meyer. So welcome, Tim. Tim is our guest for this week. Tim is an agile coach with a unique blend of experiences and insights from small businesses to Fortune 100 organizations, working in the service industry, biotech, financial services, research and development, insurance, health systems, federal and state government. Tim is trained as an engineer. He has meandered his way through life as a structural engineer, website designer, software hardware developer, inventor, project program manager, coach, and small business owner. Tim is a certified team coach with Scrum Alliance and a PCC with the International Coaching Federation and has a master's degree in leadership. When he's not working, Tim can be found volunteering as a musician at his church, working behind the scenes in the family business or traveling somewhere new. So Tim is going to talk with us today about culture, each strategy for lunch. So I want to welcome my friend, Tim Meyer. So welcome, Tim. Thank you very, very much. So let me make sure I get the right screen share. And so what I'm going to be talking about, first I want to validate, can you see my slides? Yes. Awesome. Thank you. So what I'm going to be talking about is this idea of a Scrum Master's Guide to Culture. So what is it? What does it matter? And how on earth am I going to influence it? So who am I? We talked about this a little bit. Um, I've spent probably about half of my time in the federal and state government area, working for areas like NASA, FAA, VA, and then I live in Iowa. I live in Des Moines, Iowa, so don't hold that against me. I'm not a West Coaster. I live in the middle of the country. So I've worked quite a bit with some of the state agencies here in the state of Iowa, the Iowa Department of Revenue, the Iowa Economic um, Development Association, the Iowa Utility Boards, and then also some private sectors, mostly in the financial areas, because if you know anything about Des Moines, Iowa, we are, I think, the third largest um, insurance um, location in the world. So behind, I think it's behind London and Hartford, Connecticut. So there is a ton of insurance and financials here. So when I started building this talk, I had this idea I'm going to build about Scrum Master's Guide to Culture. So one of the first things I did is I jumped on Google and kind of looked around and said, what is culture? So I started digging around, I started looking at quotes, and I saw a ton of quotes of people talking about culture, like Hubstop. It says, culture is to recruiting as product is to marketing. So they're saying that culture is so important, it's like marketing in order to get people in. Or you have the idea that cor corporate culture is the only sustainable competitive advantage that is completely within control of the entrepreneur. They said that, you know, this is the only thing an entrepreneur really has control over. Or the former CEO of IBM. And it said that I came to see in my time at IBM that culture isn't just one aspect of the game, it is the game. So I think a lot of people have seen these quotes. People have talked about how important culture is, how it's critical within the organization. But then we gotta ask the question, what? is culture. So this is where I'd love to have a few of you jump off mute. Tell me, what do you think culture is? So I, you know, hey, thanks for having me, by the way. Um, you know, I think that uh, culture has to do with environment. And it also is going to be involved with um, uh, uh, activities that are scheduled or put into a system to to bring people together. Culture involves people connecting. So when you have when you view the the groups that are being formed in your company, you're looking at the cultures and what's uniting them, what's bringing them together. Uh, okay. So uh, and and it, and it varies. Um, 
uh, greatly just depending what you're looking at. So uh, that's some of the comments I have for that. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I was going to uh, cheat. I, I went and looked up on the dictionary. It's basically the idea, customs, and social behavior of a particular people or society. <laughs> Uh, so the question was, use your dictionary or do you use Wikipedia? Uh, it looks like a dictionary. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for adding this. And, you know, there's a lot of different definitions out there. So when I really started digging, I decided, okay, if I'm going to do this talk, I got to talk. I do have to do a definition of what culture is. So what I have found is this is probably the the benefit the culture model that I love the most is from Edgar Sheen, and he talks about in his book organizational culture and leadership. He talks about culture is the deeper level of basic assumptions and beliefs that are shared by the members of an organization that operate unconsciously and define in a basic taken for granted fashion an organization's view of itself and its environment. All right, so that's a lot that I said. Let's dig into this a little bit. So first of all, culture is a deeper level. So culture is not something on the surface. It's not those posters that you see up in organizations that talk about what, um, what they say they want to believe or something like that is something deeper. And it's a level of basic assumptions and beliefs. It's not necessarily what people say, but it's what they assume and truly take internally to what they believe. But it can't just be the um, beliefs and assumptions of one or two or three people. It has to be shared by the members of the organization. So we're looking at these common beliefs by most of the members of the organization. And these operate as a unconscious and define the basic take for granted fashion. So these many times when people are looking at culture within your organization, the culture you believe in, this isn't something you're actively thinking about. You just assume this to be true. And it, it, it is what the organization views of itself and its environment. So really this is the lens at what the organization looks at not only internally, but what they look at everything else around them. So if you look at the book from Edgar Sheen's model, and he has this pretty simple model and it has this idea of artifacts, espouse beliefs and basic assumptions. So what are artifacts? These are the visible and feelable structures and processes, the observed behaviors. So how is the organization, how do they build out their hierarchy? How do people report? How many VPs do they have? Um, what kind of feelable structures and processes do they have? How do they build out their offices? I had one particular place I was working, I was working as a coach and they had all the IT people on the second floor. It was an unfinished floor in a five story building. So it had concrete floors, no ceilings, you know, you just had the beams. And the way they had it set up was all the developers were in a row with the manager at the end of the row. So the manager could look up at any time and see who was at their desk and who wasn't. So that was the feel that they had. Now, if you went up to the fifth floor where the executives were, that area of the building was all plush carpets it was hard wood walls and everybody had their own office, but in front of their office was their personal assistant and you actually had to go through their desk to get into that office. Now, from a culture standpoint, was that saying I'm open and available, you can talk to me at any time. <laughs> so these are the kind of the artifacts that exists. Okay, so built what these artifacts are built on these built are on the stated ideas goals and values of aspirations so part of this is what the organization says they believe part of it would be what are the goals what are the kind of projects they're working on or products they're working on what is the kind of work the organizations are doing what is the aspirations the vision of where they're they're going 
And this is all built on these unconscious, taken for granted beliefs, assumptions, and values that they accept to be true. I will tell you in that organization where I talked to you about where they had on the fifth floor, they had the, um, um, the hardwood walls for all the senior executives. I had a conversation with one of the VPs once, and I kind of mentioned this is the, or one of the CIOs. And I mentioned, you know, it'd probably be a good idea for you to come down and, and talk to the teams on a regular basis, because this CEO, CIO would only come down to the second floor twice a year when they had the big department meetings. And what this person did was instead of just coming down, he called one of the managers to ask, is this a good idea or not? And the managers are like, no, 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 you don't need to come down. So the beliefs this, the, this organization had was kind of reflected within how they built their artifacts. So Edgar Sheehan goes on to say in this book, the only thing of real importance that a leader can do is create and manage culture. And if you don't manage culture, it is going to manage you. And you may not even be aware this is happening. So in this organization, they weren't actively managing these things. They were kind of letting it happen. So at a high level, what actually happens? How does culture change happen? So culture change happens because what happens is you've got um, basic underlying assumptions that go to a, that that support your artifacts. And then these artifacts support your underlying assumptions. In this organization, they had this assumption that the C-suite wasn't really approachable. So they built their artifacts, their um, offices in such a way that you couldn't really approach them. So never, no one ever approached them. So let's talk about this a little bit different. Let me try to dig into this and see, get, get an idea. This is where I want to get some feedback from you. We want to talk about the culture of Scrum. Now, I assume everyone's seen this. This is from Scrum Inc. It talks about the 535, the simple rules of Scrum. How many people have actually seen something about Scrum before? I'm hoping almost everybody raises their hand because this is, this is supposed to be for an Agile group. Okay, so let's talk about the culture of Scrum. This is where I need user participation. So if we want to talk about this model, what are the artifacts of Scrum? Anybody want to jump in? The artifacts are the product product increment, the sprint backlog, and the um, um, the backlog itself. Yes. Product backlog. So for this particular thing, I'm putting the five three five because the artifacts are everything you see. It would be the meetings. It would be the backlogs. It would be the roles and all those kind of things. So if you look at the culture of Scrum, you would see the artifacts, the 535, the five, you know, the three events, the three roles, and those kind of things. Okay, so what would be the espoused beliefs of Scrum? Like continuous improvement. Uh... Delivering regular value to the customer. Yes. There's like the 12. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these kind of ideas. What I actually did was I pulled out the Scrum Guide. The actual spouse believes coming out of the Scrum Guide is this idea of empiricism and lean, you know, transparency, inspection, adaption, the commitment, focus, openness, respect, and courage. And I know this is a little unfair. I'm doing a quiz here at what after 6 p.m. on a week on, on a on a weekday. This is this is unfair. All right, one more, one more. What are the basic underlying assumptions of Scrum? This one's a little bit harder. So what I went with is the 12 Agile principles. So these would be some of the underlying assumptions that went under Scrum. 
So the reason I wanted to talk this through is to kind of explain, help everybody understand, you know, from a Scrum environment, these would be, if you're working in True Scrum, this would be your culture that you're working with. So here's the thing, we talked a little bit earlier and I talked generally about how culture change happens, how you need to build, you know, um, you need to have your artifacts build with your beliefs. But what happens if we only address the top? If we only address processes? We come into an organization and we say, okay, we're gonna have you start doing Scrum. All we care about are the rules of Scrum. You begin with training on tools, techniques, or different on frameworks, but you don't really question the underlying beliefs. What happens is, as results, is the underlying beliefs and values and basic assumptions are never questioned by the organization. So the old habits and beliefs work their way back into the system. How many people have seen this? Get some scrum enforcer come in tell people how to do it they start doing daily stand-ups and weekly iter or two-week iterations but they're just just doing this on top of a project plan <laughs> <laughs> i think we've all seen this question for you yes so are you saying that if there's not a genuine gathering of discussing this move into scrum and what we're bringing forth in change of culture, the technical tool-based uh, drier process um, involvement is just not going to work. You're saying there needs to be something that is actually, you're saying questioning deeper. So I'm diving in, what is that deeper dive look like? Um, I would say generally, yes. And I'm going to go into this in a couple slides. Hopefully this will answer it. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so what would happen if we only talked about assumptions? How many people have seen where people just talk about long discussions of beliefs, values, underlying assumptions, but they don't actually make any concrete changes in how people work? The result is how the work is done within teams. The work, how the work is done is not actually changed. We might talk about the principles, we might talk about the new behaviors, but nothing actually is there to support the beliefs. So what you really need to really make culture change, and I think everyone has seen this in a scrum environment, is you need to talk about the principles. You need to talk about the uh, uh, what people's beliefs are, but then you also need to support it with the Scrum activities. Is this making sense? Mm -hmm. All right. Now, I can almost read your mind. We have a bunch of Agilists here. My problem is not with Scrum. My problem is with the rest of the company. I know how to do this with Scrum teams, but why won't the rest of the company listen to what are we going to do with the rest of the company? All right, so let's run through a scenario here. Let's assume you're working for Big Corp LLC. And you're here, you're in custom development. You're a Scrum master in custom development. You got this great manager. This manager has decided within the custom development area you have, you're going to do Scrum. You got your Scrum team set up. You're doing your two week iterations. Things are going well, but you're having all these problems interacting with the rest of the company. So what do you do? You start looking at, okay, let's do a culture map of what's going on here. I'm gonna start with my custom development group. And we have this culture of Scrum. We do our 353, do we do our meetings? We do imperialism, we inspect, adapt, and we have transparency and we're built on the 12 Agile principles. Now, rest of the organization, we look at them. What are they? They fundamentally are a PMO organization with project plans. They believe in a division of labor and following the plans. And they are built on this idea fundamentally that managers know best, workers need to be controlled, and work can be fully known if we would just plan well enough. 
So we start looking at that. We look in the other, other parts of the culture. So what happens is, is that we start mapping these and we realize we put it here. We kind of look at the different areas. We color code the areas. We look at our culture and here we are. We're in this green culture. Um, we have this other part over here. That's that red culture we're talking about. And let's say we've got some COTS development over here. They're a little bit different. They have their own little culture here. Now, one thing I wanna let you know, the fact that I did re, um, green, yellow, and red here is a little biased. You know, I'm an agile coach. I'm going to impose the idea that, you know, this is the good culture and those are the bad cultures. You know, that's what the colors say. Um, there really is no good culture versus bad culture. It is just a culture. It is, the question is, is, is it getting the results? Is it getting, is it doing what the organization really needs? So if we look at this, what we'll actually find out is we have this idea of a cultural bubble. We have a different culture that is within a larger organizational cover, culture. Now, remember, we have fundamentally different beliefs and different practices. So how do we talk with these other areas? The idea is you need to talk through what we call cultural adapters. If you've done software development, you can have different systems talk to each other through these ideas of APIs. And, and these are common ways that they can talk to each other. Now we can't talk necessarily directly. We have to find these cultural adapters. So what on earth is a cultural adapter? Cultural adapter is a way of working. It's an artifact that bridges, bridges the different assumptions and espouse beliefs between different cultures. Now within this presentation, I'm gonna talk about it within an organization, okay? Cultural exam, um, adapters work pretty much anywhere, anywhere you have different cultures. So this can actually work outside of organizations. This example is primarily within organizations. Now, I want us to have one note. The bigger the difference between the assumption and the espouse beliefs, the harder it is to develop a cultural adapter that both cultures will accept. Really, when we dig into these cultural adapters, we're looking for where is kind of that small common ground that we can both agree on. And then how do we build on top of it? And also this idea of cultural flexibility will also influence the development of adapters. Depending on how long a culture has been within an organization will influence this. If you have a really young organization or a really young department that's only been for a couple of years, the culture will be most likely more flexible than an organization that has been around for a hundred years. And that has to do that, that determines what the cultural flexibility is. It also cultural flexibility depends on the type of people you have in it and how they are willing to try different things, their willingness to uh, experiment. Now, one thing as we dig in, we're going to dig into this a little bit, talk a little bit more about these cultural adapters. Want you to understand if you've ever looked at the Kinevin model, this talks about sense, uh, a sense making framework where it talks about what type of problems you have. Cultural change, because we're fundamentally looking at cultural change, borders on the complex and chaotic area. And if you know anything about Kinevin, in order to deal with complex problems, this is not something you can just plan up front and know what the results are going to be. You really need to experiment through complex problems. And creating adapters also exist in this area. So this isn't what, something you can sit down just to find. You literally need to go through an experiment process. So how do we, at kind of an intellectual or level, how do you develop a core uh, cultural adapter? So I'm gonna map this out using a um, kind of an experimentation framework of, of this idea of you observe and assess, then you develop a plan and then you implement it with the ideas you circle back around and say, based on this, we wanna observe what happens. So you wanna start out 
by observing what the current artifacts are within both cultures. So if I'm looking at my culture and I'm also looking at the other culture, I want to look at what are their artifacts. What do they look like? What are the differences? What are the similarities? The next thing I want to do is I want to uh, try to assess and expose the values and the assumptions that are underlying the present artifacts. Now, some of these values might be easy. They might be stated values. Some of these values may not be easy. You might need to talk to some people and try to get that. And some of these will be just basic gut assumptions that you try to use. Okay, I'm assuming this is the value and, and the assumptions that is underlying these. Based on that, you want to develop a common value, a proposed common value and assumptions for going forward. We looked at what we're having. Now, how do we find a way that we can both be on the same page? And this is really getting into the what do we want to believe? We started out with what is being done? What do people want? What do people believe? What do we want to believe? And then we start out by implementing the artifacts to support the new common beliefs. So this is where we try something out. Now, we will need to observe to see if this works. Now, this might seem like a pretty generic, I don't know how this actually works out. So what I wanted to do is give you an example of a particular cultural adapter I did when I was working at the state of Iowa. I was a program manager. I was also working kind of as an agile coach, had a number of software teams develop uh, under me, and we were working on the Iowa tax credit system. Now, what this did was it monitored and it um, evaluated all tax credits within the state of Iowa. So we would get IRS feeds when people e-filed, we would have businesses file for um, tax credits, like if you're doing solar panels, those kind of things, all this went through our system. Now we had a time where we were working with our contract office and we were asked to fill out a yearly statement of work. And so I had the contract officer contact me and say, hey, I need you to fill out a statement of work. Here's an example of the last one. So I looked at it. It was this big, long Gantt chart of what people were doing, when people were doing it, what process were done when, you know, I mean, all the different features, all these things. It was this multiple page thing. I took a look at it and I said, how long did it take for this to be put together? The guy said, oh, probably about a month, month and a half. Now, here I am. I'm leading a bunch of scrum teams with a product owner and a product sponsor. We're primarily working off a product roadmap. Um, we are prioritizing what is our highest priority work, you know, based on what tax credits we had to prioritize is mainly from a dollar standpoint, you know, we were working on the biggest ones and working our ways down with the number of taxpayers. And we were doing new product development and support. And I'm sitting there thinking, you got to be kidding me. Here we are, we're doing agile. And I have to do this yearly statement of work. Okay, so the first question that ran through my mind is, mm, what if I ignore it? Well, this was a statement of work that paid for all of us. So not going to ignore it because I won't have a job anymore. <laughs> so I sit down with the product owner or with the contract officer, and I'm like, help me understand where all this came from. Well, I found out the big Gantt chart was the idea of the previous project, uh, uh, program manager that was there before me. And I'm sitting there going, so do you need all this details? And he says, no, really what we need is we want to know what you're going to do, how much it's going to cost, because we have to support an audit, a yearly audit that the state does that may basically shows this is what we paid for and this is what we got. So sat down with him, sat down with the product project sponsor that we're product sponsor we we're working on, and we decided we developed what we called an agile statement of work. So we started out and I wanted to know how often do you needed to know time, scope and budget? He said, well, basically, I want to know how much you spend on a month by month basis. Wow, that's easy for us. We have fixed teams, <laughs> fixed burn rate. 
you know, I was able to calculate that in about, you know, what, about 10 minutes. And then I'm like, okay, the scope part, this is the important part. How detailed do you want to know the scope? And he said, well, we basically want to know what you plan on working on in advance so we can let this um, uh, audit department be able to validate it. So we came up with this idea of we took our product roadmap and we assigned what we called feature points to each one of our products. And then we put this in a list of a prioritized list and we define the scope by how many points we could achieve within a year at the feature level. Now, what we also did was we included a way for the sponsor to change priority at any time. Now, this was a proposal that we had with the um, contract office and they were totally fine with, they were absolutely acceptable because it met their requirements of supporting a multi-year contract and being auditable and it had scope, time, and budget into it. Now, the benefit was is that this whole feature map that I talk about with the uh, product roadmap with feature points, we had myself, my tech lead, my, my um, test lead, and the product sponsor get together for four hours one afternoon and we defined the entire thing. I think I had a two-day turnaround on the statement of work. Contract office said that was the fastest they've ever seen the statement of work. So this was a cultural adapter that we built. Now, one thing you need to understand is when you look at organizations, you're going to need different adapters for different areas. Like here, operations is going to have probably a different culture than COTS development. So you're going to have to build these different adapters. So how on earth do you get started? So what I have found is this book here, The Delicate Art of Bureaucracy, is a great way of looking at different ways to get into these and evaluate cultural adapters. Now, I said at the beginning, I've spent a lot of my time, probably half of my time, in either state or federal government. So I'm going to be somewhat biased on the ones that I use here, because these are going to be the ones that I found works very well in state government and federal government. Now this contains 41 ideas that you can help transform a bureaucratic culture. I'm gonna cover a couple of these. I will tell you not all 41 ideas work with all cultures. Some are gonna work great. Some are not gonna work well at all. So one of these that I like to use is this idea of provoke and observe give you an example of this. You know, what, what we talk about this is large organizations are complex and self-healing. It's difficult to impossible to know all the underlying assumptions. Give you an example of a provoke and observe I did when I was working at the um, OCIO at the state of Iowa. Um, they had a policy when I got there that all deployments had to be approved by managers meaning going from test to QA or QA to UAT had to be signed off by a manager. So I had a pretty good relationship with one of the managers and one of our tech leads sent down a request to get something deployed and I was sitting there in a meeting and she looked at it and, and said something about, okay, yeah, sure, that's fine. And I made the comment, I said, well, you know, I'm sure glad that you're rubber stamping our deployments because this was the tech lead that was in our area and she got a little defensive. She's like, what do you mean I'm rubber stamping? I'm not rubber stamping. And I looked at her and I said, you know, and her name was Kirsten. I said, Kirsten, let's be real. You've got how many different teams under you? You don't know what any of that stuff is doing. You're not looking at the code. How do you validate whether you actually, whether we actually should move it to, uh, to the next environment or not? I said, you contact the tech lead and ask if it's okay. And if the tech lead says, yes, you approve it, correct? Yeah. I said, well, didn't that email come from the tech lead? Well, yeah. Isn't it already then following your approval? So what I ended up doing was provoking and observing with her. It's kind of like, okay, what can we do? I was able to work with her in order to determine that we could get, we were able to within our organization, do it all the way up to UAT. They still wanted to um, approve the pr uh, production moves. And that was one of these things, a provoke and observe. 
Another one that I've done too is we used to have to do these monthly reports on what we did and what we didn't do. So I wrote these reports, they ended up being four, five, six pages long. And I started putting a comment on the bottom. Hey, if you find this report useful, please contact me. I would love to hear what's valuable, what you find uh, you know, useful in this. After about the third month, I said, this is going to be the last one if no one contacts me. I found out I had one person contact me at the end. Happened to be my boss. So I turned around and, and I had a, had, a, had a conversation with her. I said, you know, we're spending how many hours producing this and you're the only one that ever contacted me. What can we do to minimize the amount of work? This is not value added. So some of the things you could possibly do here is stop publishing a report to see if anyone notices or comments. Just quit doing something. Literally change the way information is exchanged to customers. I also have done this last one many, many times to see, I kind of quote unquote forget to schedule a meeting. See if anyone even says anything. So this is one of the things you can do, this idea of provoke and observe. Can you change the culture? Can you build an adapter this way? Can you help them change their mind? The other one I've done is advertise the cost of compliance. The government is terribly uh, um, um, bad at requiring all types of compliance. You know, most projects here are weighed on the positive aspects, but they never talk about the cost accrued when the, um, from the culture. So what I've done is I've actually done this. I've done value stream mapping within the organization to kind of show, okay, who needs to be contacted? When do they need to be contacted? What is the wait times? You know, talking about that previous example about talking to the manager, we actually eventually looked at how much wait time was available in that process of getting her to approve a deployment. Is actually interesting. After we got this off her plate, she actually made a comment about a month later. She said, you know, she has a lot more free time. She actually started going home or, uh, on time because she would consistently be there till maybe six, seven o'clock every night. She actually started going, to, uh, going home at a more regular hours. So you can either do value stream mapping or you can use maybe some A-B analysis to show how the cost of the current system is versus new ways of working map it out you know maybe you can set up side by side paths on what's working and what isn't the other one i think we really really talk about here is this idea of promoting transparency but how do you do that um disasters are awfully public but the cost of guarding against them seldom are so what I've done here in this in the government space sometimes is I actually start tagging stories as which ones are what we consider to be value based ones that are actually providing value to the customer versus which ones that are compliance based which ones are there in order to fill out the paperwork. Um, right now I work for a couple federal agencies and, I, and I'm helping some teams working with um, in the cybersecurity area. And there's an amazing number of these, what they call POAMs. And these are basically plans to get them into um, compliance with cybersecurity. I've seen teams spend 70, 80% of their time filling out plans to get into compliance and they don't have much time to actually do the work to be compliant because they're spending most of their time filling this out. So we've been tagging stories based on compliance. We also have been looking at if there is um, compliance is built into the definition of done of your teams, actually story point the amount of effort that's due to compliance. I've done this with other teams. They might say this is an eight point story, but if I didn't have to do the compliance work, maybe it's a three. And then start publishing these metrics with external stakeholders. What kind of transparency can you have in the compliance area? These are the kind of things that I've used to actually try to build adapters because when people realize 
because I've had this before when people realize maybe 45% of their budget is being used just for compliance, then you start asking the question, do you know, is there better ways to reduce the compliance costs? Is there better ways to um, look at this? Another one is this idea of don't waste an emergency. I had one particular um, um, incident when I was working at the, the tax system, the Iowa um, tax system, where one of the departments we were working for, Economic Development Association, they had this idea that no one in our team should be able to see any production data. They said it was private. They didn't want any of their customers to know what kind of, uh, uh, want us looking around at their customer information. They didn't want any, uh, any access to production system at all. Now we were the system, we were the group that supported that. We supported production, yet we were not given access to production. They also would not let us have any of their data for testing. So I brought this up as this is, this is gonna be a potential failure mechanism. We're gonna have a time when everything goes down and it actually happened one day. They did something in production, took the entire system down and it took us like 24 to 48 hours to go back to our tapes, to get everything and to uh, rebuild the system and get it back. So what we ended up doing is this gave us an opportunity to show them how important it was for us to have production access in these emergencies. And it gave us the ability to start talking about what are their fundamental beliefs and their understandings on this. They thought if our developers had production access, we would just be randomly going in there and looking at all their customer lists and stuff like that. They didn't realize that we were so busy doing stuff. The only time we ever went to production was when things were broken. So we were able to identify ways to build into um give ourselves access to production so we could do firefighting and we were able to address this so we won't have these problems in the future now one caveat here i'm going to ask that you don't create emergencies intentionally just to push this one of the last things that i've used too to build these adapters in order to build connections between the different cultures is get into these reading the fine print now there is a difference between assumptions rules policies regulations and laws most of the people don't know which is which they don't know if they're true or not and they don't dig into them so one thing I've also done is try to become an expert in the fine print. When I was working at the state, I would actually read the tax law in order to determine as we're doing this, what do we really need to do? In fact, I will tell you, I had one instance where I actually changed one of the state attorney's mind on how we should do some stuff because I actually had read the tax law at a finer level than they did. And I started asking them questions. Do we really need to do it this way? So try to become an expert in the fine print. You can ask things like, can I see this specific law policy or contract just to make sure we're complying with this? If your agile team is asked to do something, you know, really ask the question, sure, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. Help us understand exactly what we need to do. Can you give me the references and the documentation? And once you know this, you can find creative solutions. Now, one of the most important things I have found for trying to build these cultural adapters to help change culture is really find others to help you. I mean, culture is ultimately the, uh, the beliefs of, of, of the organization, the assumptions and beliefs of everybody. So try to find these people within the organization that can help. Find these people that can help move. You can help them change their mind. And celebrate the small wins. Create information networks within of change agents within your organization. Now, when I've talked about this with other people before, when I talk about these ideas of cultural adapters, I usually get this people saying, oh, yeah, we do that. We might not call it that, but we do that. This is where I'd love to hear 
based on everything I've said, what has worked for you? What has worked in your environments? If you're willing to jump off mute and share what has worked for you, I'd love to hear it. I guess I'll start. Um, I work at a university and when I first started uh, several years ago, they didn't have telecommuting uh, whatsoever. I, I guess because the um, senior management had concerns about well, what happens if the person got injured at home? Would we be accountable for a workman's compensation and all mm -hmm. sorts of legalistic uh, nonsense? And what we did is that we did a pilot project, and this is what our uh, um, my manager and, and his manager, who's the CIO, and we actually took a few people and we worked from home, and we showed that we were still productive, we were still delivering projects uh, on time, and. It was actually good that we were successful in doing that, then extended and just opened it a little bit more. And then when the pandemic hit, we were able to just slide straight into telecommuting. So I think it was good that we did that. Otherwise it would have been probably difficult because also we wouldn't have even had the infrastructure set up in place to work remotely uh, and stuff. So that's something that uh, I think it was beneficial to actually get people to understand that people can work, some people can work anywhere and still be effective. Very cool, very cool. Anyone else, have you done stuff like this before? What have you done? I can really relate to your example about the culture adapter where you mapped the, where you created the Agile SOW. That's exactly what I have to do. And um, truthfully, it took me a long time to convince my present team to let go of a project plan. <laughs> that was one of the biggest challenges. And we've even had senior leadership escalations um, in the enterprise-wide transformation program where they couldn't see project plans and they were really scared. And they were just, and it's hard to convince them that we don't need it. We have roadmaps and yep, and our metrics, right? So yeah, very cool. Great, thank you. Yeah. Hey Tim, I'll share about the provoke and observe. Uh, as an agile coach, I've often challenged people on their transformation journey to do just that. I wasn't familiar with the terms. But basically, the one bullet you have there, where is stop doing that and see what happens. Yep. Does anybody really care? Why are you really doing that? So I'll often challenge them, and people are like, yeah, that's not valuable, or they can get that information in other ways. Why am I spending time doing this? Why is my team doing that? So, so that's one that I'm often pushing, and I usually have seen success on that. But I can't even think of a time where that's backfired at all. <laughs> So that, that one works pretty well. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? You have some ideas? I could comment. You know, I just wanted to validate some of the things you said. You know, when, when you're dealing with an organization, uh, you got to rally other people's involvement. You, I noticed that when I'm working with an organization, this is off department off, off industry, but even in large church organizations, when you want to accomplish something, it can't necessarily be your opinion. You want to gather multiple people's opinions involved to move something forward that you want to accomplish. So yes, it started out with you, but I noticed as I began to ask around and, and see if there's something that we can do, and uh, you know, if we want to be able to make a difference and, and support another nonprofit that's feeding the homeless, it has to have to be motivated from other people's motivation rather than just my own for it to get movement capacity, movement capacity. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that hopefully has been helpful for you. My goal was to cover the idea of cultural adapters, um, kind of talk about a little bit of the different ways you can try to um, identify ways to do this. I'd love to say this is the one cultural adapter that works in all situations, but the fact is they are so unique to the organization 
You have to just work through and find it yourself. Any questions, anything you want to discuss? And if you don't have yeah. in it, I totally I understand. Should... Yes, go ahead. I'm curious about uh, the real shift that I think is hard is people who are in power and executive position that have a view on what they believe will work. And now you've kind of, you've got a provoking step. You've got to involve other people to kind of rally the troops to, to get uh, you know the executive's attention. Is there something else that you found in direct conversation with these people who can make a difference, how they have been willing to hear your opinion when it differs from theirs. Have you found an approach um, that, that gets them to shift um, other than what you've already mentioned? You know, in, in my opinion, um, when you get to the senior leaders and, and, and the people of power, that's very difficult because many times they're not going to tell you what their underlying beliefs and assumptions are because many times they don't have time to really think through them. A lot of people on the senior levels have to make lots of decisions very, very fast. So what I have found, what has ha helped for me sometimes is trying to get those relationships with those people and get into a trusted environment and then find times early early in the morning or late in the day i will tell you here that um you know this is this meeting was at i think it's what 8 p.m my time it started i was actually having conversations with one of the executives at seven o'clock tonight for one of my executives so now i'm not saying everybody's capable of doing that but i have found trying to find that time to be that trusted advisor where you can really dig into it um, the other thing is, is there are times when I'll say stuff, I know we don't have time to get into a coaching session, but we do need to dig into this. When do you have time? And being able to be honest with them and understand the confines of their organization and their time. Now, this is just my humble thoughts. I'm sure there's other people here that have worked with executives. Mm -hmm. What do they want to add? Please add. <laughs> yeah, so when, um, as a general, of course, when we don't want to be overly prescriptive. Yet when dealing with executives, you have to switch to a more advising and transformational stance um, versus facilitation and training. You have to guide them along and you have to be ready to dance at the moment. Um, one moment you might be a consultant, giving them exactly what they need to do. Another moment you say, this is my advice and go from there. Yeah, and the model that works for you is not something that works for everybody. You have to discover that yourself through ex, you know, experiment and practice and feedback. Yeah. Thank you for adding that, I appreciate it. <laughs> There's no silver, silver bullet to coaching, is endless practice and constant learning and being humble. Yeah. And willingness to understand you're gonna face plant at least a couple times. Um, how do you, work toward preventing dilution of the quality on either side when you are doing a cultural translator. Make sure things don't get lost in translation. Oh, wow. You know, oh. is, that another, is that a whole other topic? No, that is an awesome, awesome, that's an awesome question because I've had situations like that where you build the translator and all of a sudden it seems to start going sideways and that's one of the reasons why i bring into the kinevin model this idea you need to be continuously evaluating your translators you need to continuously look at 
is this helpful? Because what's going to happen is, is you're going to have this translator and it's going to affect the underlying behaviors and assumptions on both those cultures. And it's going to start moving this. And, and culture in many ways is, an, is a living organism. It's going to try to find its, its, its stable position. So as this culture translate or the, as the adapter gets built, it's going to start shifting things and then it's no longer going to fit. And then you need to adapt and move the adapter again and redesign it. And, and yes, this gets exhausting. <laughs> it's, but it's more than remapping your endpoints. It's, it's, I think the issue is to, it's like when you take languages that are radically different, and they have completely different concepts. Um, romantic languages with feminine and masculine words. Um, you can't really translate those well. Yeah. Um, but I mean, the, the C-suite is going to want to do what the C-suite wants to do. And you you got to do what's right for your development team and, and those people who are working in agility. Um, you just want to make sure one doesn't overpower the other. I know that, but I'm, I'm kind of, I, I get the idea by using the definite and I will, but um Yeah, the, the joy of being the complex domain, you are constantly having to try, do, evaluate, retry, you know, just keep running that learning cycle. Okay. And, 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 and trying to evaluate. I mean, the key is, is how do you evaluate it, you know, faster each time? It's about, you know, it's how we teach scrum teams to work and development team. How do you, how quickly can you evaluate what you're doing is right? You know, and it, it kind of gets into that. Unfortunately, culture changes at a lot slower pace. You know, it, it isn't like it's a DevOps pipeline. You can just run it through. Yeah. Any other questions or thoughts? How do you deal with cultural shit or have build a cultural adapter when one company is acquiring another? That's currently what I'm working with then is like, you know, when big media company buying three other media companies, throwing them up together, the org chart is basically an etch-a-sketch every year. You know, they just keep doing reorg after reorg and, yeah. um, and just trying to build those connectors as this is similar to what you were saying that both sides are still moving as you're building the connector and having to keep rebuilding it. <laughs> Yeah, but, and, and that is really, really hard because if you have, let's say, three or four companies, you know, one company by three or four other companies and then quote unquote merge them all, what happened is, is you got these micro bubbles of cultures all over the place. Exactly. And then these micro bubbles are cultures are trying to figure out what is our new culture going to be. They're extremely fluid. They, they, they're, they're willing to flex and stuff like that. So it's constantly trying to figure out you know, what is our new culture? And, and what the assumptions are, because you have made the assumptions, because since yes. we don't know what our shared assumptions are, they're constantly checking them to see where they are, what the boundaries are. Exactly. Right. Now, in some ways that can actually be good because you're having somewhat of um, cultural turbulence. And you, if, <laughs> if you have the ability, you can start establishing the assumptions and the beliefs within the organization. Now, that also means other people or departments or senior leaders with positional authority can do the same thing. So it can be yeah. beneficial or it can be detrimental. <laughs> so, yeah. man, I wish I had a, a magic, uh, you know, a magic wand on that one. That's super tough. But I would say what, do, what you should do is almost imagine you have all these different bubbles everywhere. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and when you start looking at it that way, sometimes it makes more sense because then you can see things and say, okay, now I understand the why. To get entity relationship diagram and just doing that within these different bubbles, really, yes. right? And how they got there and why. And the yeah. crazy yeah. thing is, is organizations are living. So those bubbles, they want to try to find, they want to try to merge. They want to try to find their, you know, home, what is it, homeostasis? Yeah. I think it is. Yeah. And they want to try to get to where they don't have all this conflict. Thank you. That was a great answer. Appreciate it.
All right, let's do a big thank you for Tim. Tim, awesome talk. You've got me thank thinking. You. you got me relating thank to you. things that I'm doing and things I'm done, which is pretty yeah. hard to do for me. So you really, <laughs> you really got me going, which I love. So a big thank you to Tim Meyer. Appreciate that awesome talk. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, we're going to move into our little gameplay and a little bit of open space sharing. And let me show you what that looks like. All right, so we've got our Scrum and Wine Trello board, our typical board that we've done for those of you who joined before. We're going to start with the scavenger hunt. And Tim, I have a favor when you get on here. Are you okay sharing a PDF or a copy of your presentation with everybody? Yeah. Okay, you're on mute, but I can see it looked like you said absolutely. If I, I said absolutely. Instance. I'm yep, just going to have to lips. create one without all the other extra slides in the back that I've hidden. Okay, so if you can do that when you, <laughs> let me share the Trello board. So I'm going to share this with everybody right now. And I'm going to share and share and share and share the board. Um, usually I share it with the thing. Ah, here, Grayling. Copy link. All right, there we go. I'm going to put that in chat. So in chat, there is our Trello board. Come join that Trello board. And uh, you can join as a guest visitor, whatever you need to do to get on there. And then we're going to break into teams. We're going to break into teams of an elementary school, middle school, uh, high school. I'm going to do, I think, Three teams feels about right. Yeah, we'll do three teams, kind of right size it a little bit. When you get into your breakout room, you're going to complete the scavenger hunt as a team. There are things to do here. I'm going to close that real quick. But there are things to do you and your team need to do. Get all of those answered, and you'll come back to the main session. So we'll start with that. Then we'll get into maybe a few minutes of open space discussion, whatever else is on your mind that you want to talk about um, before we hit the end of our time box. The Small Bytes presentation is available here in the resources. So if you want to get a copy of that, open up Small Bytes. You can get a copy of the PDF from all those events. Many of them are hyperlinked if you want to get access to them. At the end of the session, wait till the end, you can get your Scrum Education Units. These are dynamic and set up by Scrum Alliance. So if you've been here the whole two hours, all you have to do is click this link. It'll automatically add it to your Scrum Alliance profile if you are logged in. So if not, log in and then click it, and it will automatically get you the two SEUs or one if you were here for an hour, but we've already been here an hour, 20 minutes, so two is just fine. Take that. Um, Tim, will, Tim, when you get a chance, you can load it into this box. So you come here, there's an attachment. You can add an attachment or drag and drop it here. This is where you can get Tim's bio, a description of the session, and Tim will put a copy of the PDF there. Okay, any questions here? Otherwise, I'm going to open up these breakout rooms and go ahead and do your scavenger hunt. And I will time box this for a max. Let's do a maximum of 10 minutes. If you're done quicker, please come back. First team comes back, gets a round of applause. All right, rooms are opening. You're either elementary, middle, or high school. Okay. 